Hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, and maybe some of the good afternoon in some places of the world. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, today mm, we are going to provide uh, a training webinar on how to use uh, VR's data and introduce some of the VR's data for air quality monitoring. Uh, the Presentations are divided into two parts. Uh, I will, my name is Pawan Gupta. I'm a research scientist here at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. In first session, I will provide uh, some details on the viewers and data sets and how to get those. And then uh, Dr. Melanie Follett Cook uh, from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, she will talk about how to deep dive uh, into VS data using some of the Python tools. Okay, with that brief introduction, uh, let me briefly uh, show you where to get the material. Uh, I'm sure most of you are getting that details through uh, emails and through the chat box. Uh, but uh, briefly, um, the training which we are providing today is from through NASA's RSET Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. It's a program funded through NASA's Applied Science Program and under which there is a capacity building program, which actually the goal is to build the capacity all around the world to use Earth observation for various applications. So this specific training is focused on air quality application, but we do have trainings in other areas like disaster, water management, water land use management, fires, and other kind of stuff. So feel free to visit that uh, website, which has been provided in the emails and on the chat box. Uh, let me just briefly go to the website for this training so that I can show you where to look for the so let me see if I can share my screen. I think you're already seeing my screen, I believe. So what you see here is the website which has been linked. So this is our training page. You can find some details, uh, the timing. And then if you go a little bit down in this page, you will see the material. Under material, the presentation slides for today's, which are also provided in a PDF in a link. The homework, there is a homework for this uh, training in order to get a certificate. And then, although we are not actually providing the training itself in Spanish, but we make the material available in Spanish. Uh, because uh, this is only one session. Usually we have two to three sessions, but this is uh, only one session and very focused. And we are assuming that most people who are doing this training uh, will have some uh, uh, expertise or some uh, knowledge in using satellite data for various applications. So the title is uh, Modus to Weird Transition for Air Quality Application. And again, the website uh, have all the presentation, homework, everything. Uh, we will also provide the recording should be available in a few days if you have questions. Uh, uh, after the training, feel free to us uh, to reach out to either me or Melanie on the given email address. So like I said, the objective for this specific training session is to learn about the viewers aerosol product uh, and how to access those, uh, how and understand the differences and similarities between the MODIS and VR instruments and their quality product, and then see some of the examples where we can use VR's aerosol data for air quality application. So before uh, we move on to the data sets, I want to just give a very brief perspective, historical perspective, because the as many of you already might know that VR's is a uh, more NOAA mission and NOAA has a historical uh, view of looking global weather uh, through various uh, polar orbiting satellites. So this is called NOAA Polar Satellite Program, um, and the objective is to actually get a continuous weather observation from all around the world. 
And NOAA has been launching this satellite called NOAA 14, 15, 18, 19. And then in 2011, uh, they launched a satellite called SUMI NPP. It was a partnership between NOAA and NASA, which has a VS, first of the VIA sensor, it was launched. And typically these uh, shows actually the lifetime for the mission which is designed. So it's typically five to seven years. In 2017, NOAA uh, and NASA launched another uh, mission called JPSS-1, Joint Polar Orbiting Satellite System Program, uh, which was later uh, named as NOAA-20, which is also in orbit. So there are two VIRs right now in orbit. And as you can see from this chart, there are JPSS-2, 3, and 4 already in plan. So the key, thing to understand here is that VIRS a, is a continuous, uh, uh, the mission, the role of VIRS is actually to provide continuous measurement from all around the world using polar orbiting satellite. So if you are switching to VIRS from the MODIS now, it is good time because we will have VIRS data uh, in next 20 years uh, until uh, 2038. Uh, so we will have a continuous records. So just give you a very historical perspective. Now, the first VS was launched on a SUMI NPP satellite. SUMI, Burma, uh, e. SUMI was a well-known meteorologist. He was considered as father of satellite meteorology. He was professor at University of Wisconsin, and the satellite was named in honor of his, him. And it has uh, five different sensors. So uh, VIRS is just one of them. Uh, VIRS is trained for visible and infrared imager and radiometer suits. And it has been designed uh, very much like MODIS to uh, do the application on land, atmosphere, and ocean. But there are other sensors like CRIS, ARMS, ATN, Cirrus. Uh, they have been also part of this uh, NPP satellite. And they have different application objectives. So for example, ARMS also provide some useful information on air quality and specifically designed to monitor the ozone layer and ozone in the atmospheres. CIRAS is another relevant sensor which provides uh, important information on Earth radiation budget. Uh, for those who are new to the satellite world or uh, the MODIS has been in service for almost 20 years. Like I described earlier, each sensors are typically designed for five to seven years or three to five years, but uh, both MODIS have been actually providing data for almost 17 plus years, or one of them is 20 years. So we have the data all the way from 2000 to current. And there are two MODIS. One is on Terra, which makes measurement in the morning, MODIS Aqua, which makes measurement in the afternoon. The spatial resolution of MODIS uh, varies from 250 meter to one kilometer, depending on which spectral channel we are using. Uh, this is the native resolution, and we'll talk about the product resolution later on. Uh, there are 36 different spectral channels in MODIS, and it provides measurement both over land and ocean. So the top image shows the MODIS Aqua, bottom shows MODIS Terra. Uh, just to, for comparison, the similar piece of information is here for visible. Again, uh, there are two VIRS in orbit currently. One is VIRS on SUMI NPP, which I just described. And then there is a VIRS on NOAA 20 or JPSS-1. Uh, no, like I said, the NOAA has a little bit different way of naming satellite. Uh, they do uh, provide one name before the satellite is launched. In this case, it was JPSS-1. And when the satellite is launched and operational, uh, they rename it and it becomes a part of their NOAA series. So this is now called NOAA 20. Uh, before it was launched, it was called JPSS-1. So just don't confuse about that. Uh, they are the same satellite. Uh, again, uh, it's a very, very similar to MODIS. Uh, the data sets which we have available from VIRS is 2011 onwards. The spatial resolution varies from 375 meter to 750 meter. Uh, there are two types of bands in VIRS. One is called I-band and one is called M-band. Um, M band resolution is 750 meter resolution, and then the I band is 375 meter resolutions. Uh, the temporal resolution, as you can see in the image, and I'll show you next, uh, is a little bit uh, uh, better than MODIS. And there are 22 spectral bands in the 
uh, in the years as compared to 36 in the case of Modis. So let's look a little bit more, uh, compare, uh, see the differences, similarities between Modis and Beers. Again, uh, in historical perspective, uh, the NPP mission, which was, uh, which carried first Beer instrument in 2011, was a uh, more like serving between bridge between NASA EOS mission, which was part of Modis Terra and Aqua missions and uh, JPSS satellite series of satellites, like I mentioned earlier, there will be four JPSS series, JPSS 1 to 4, and the, there is a mandate for NOAA to provide a continuous measurement until 2038. So uh, it kind of bridged between the two uh, series of the satellite. Um, if you have been familiar with the satellite community, you might have heard the program called NPPOS um, that was actually previously called uh, the same mission uh, is now renamed as JPSS. And JPSS mission is actually developed by NASA, but for the NOAA. So NOAA is more, it's more of NOAA mission than NASA. NASA's part is basically to develop the satellite, launch the satellite and maybe uh, maintain the data stream, but the NOAA is the main users and uh, operating agency for entire JPSS mission. So here are some details. I think I have already gone through these in earlier slides, uh, but this is just for your uh, brief reference. Now, let's see the some similarities and differences between MODIS and VIRS in terms of the coverage. So on the left, you have two MODIS. On top is Aqua, on bottom is MODIS Terra. Again, MODIS Terra makes measurement in the morning, MODIS Aqua makes measurement in the afternoon. So what you see here, the black, line in the middle of the swath here, this space in case both modis, that is called orbital gaps. And this is because of the swath width of modis. Modis has a swath width of 2330 kilometer. And at the equator, uh, that swath width actually have produced some orbital gaps from one orbit to another orbit. And we lose the data in those orbital gaps. We don't have any measurement. So when we say mode is daily coverage, it's not daily, it's really one to two days. But the advantage is we have two measurement, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. On the right, you have the VIRS coverage for the same day. So uh, on the top is VIRS on SUMI NPP, on the bottom is VIRS on NOAA 20. And what you see that those orbital gaps are gone in the case of VIRS. One more thing important to remember here is that uh, VIRS sensor on both are almost identical. There are some uh, differences in terms of their respective response function, but otherwise the sensor design channels, everything are identical. Now the NOAA 20 actually flies about 50 minutes ahead of uh, SOMI NPP. So the NOAA 20 makes uh, both two viewers actually makes measurement within 50 minutes of each other on a given place. So if you look the two images uh, from the viewers, they will look really identical because things doesn't move that much in 50 minutes. Uh, and you will see now those orbital gaps have gone and that is because of the swath width. So the viewer swath width is about 3060 kilometer uh, and that actually makes uh, continuous global coverage uh, even at the equator. And in fact, there is a 15% overlap between orbit uh, in equatorial regions. So just keep in mind, VIRS does provide better uh, global coverage on a daily scale. Uh, again, this is for your reference. Just want to point out some more details on the uh, similarities and differences between VIRS and MODIS. Uh, like I said, there are two VIRS. Um, if you see, uh, both VIRS are identical in all of those aspects, except there's a time difference, uh, equatorial crossing time. VIRS NPP is uh, 1.30 local time, and whereas the VIRS uh, on NOAA 20 is 12.40 local solar time. The SWAT, resolution, everything else remains same. Uh, okay, now let's talk about the quality product uh, from VIRS. Um, so there are multiple uh, product which we have been using uh, from MODIS. Uh, one of the most popular one to monitor the particulate matter air pollution 
uh, or particles loading in the atmosphere is called aerosol optical depth. I'm not going to get into the details of what is aerosol optical depth. I'm assuming most people are uh, familiar with that. If you are not, please go through some of the fundamental training, uh, which we kind of define what that parameter is. Uh, it represents the columnar loading and its optical property. It's a unitless and it can be used as a proxy for PM2.5 monitoring. So it does have aerosol optical depth. Uh, uh, fire detection is another which we get from MODIS and then the true color images which we often use to visualize uh, what is happening in the Earth atmosphere system. So VIRS has almost all of those, both VIRS, SUMI NPP and NOAA 20, almost all. In addition, um, NOAA actually provide two additional um, important piece of information called smoke detection and dust detection and we'll look into that. So in addition to what MODIS is providing, uh, VIRS has some additional information on the air quality. Uh, now we will continue about the looking some of the data sets uh, which we have been using from MODIS and uh, what similarities or differences which we can have when we use from the beer. So first and uh, most useful, I would say, and most people actually like to use that data sets is called uh, true color images. So the true color images, um, as we know, are actually uh, formed using the measurement in the three wavelength, uh, red, green, and blue. We have been doing that using these three bands in MODIS and the VIRS has uh, almost identical three bands uh, with little bit difference in the specific wavelength, uh, but we have the similar three wavelengths in the VIRS. So we can get the true color images from the viewers as well. And you can actually get those true color images access uh, from NASA Worldview. Uh, if you have not used it before, um, feel free to watch some of the tutorials which we have on our website and we can go over that uh, later part in the training. Now let's look at the NASA aerosols data sets. So aerosols data, when I say aerosols data, mostly uh, uh, we are talking about the aerosol optical depth. And as people who are familiar with the MODIS Terra and Equa product, uh, the spatial resolution, uh, initially when the sensor was launched in early 2000, the data was available in 10 kilometer resolution. Then later on, three kilometer data was also made available. And most recently, uh, there was a new algorithm called Maya, which actually used, uh, retrieved the data at one kilometer spatial resolution. So. In case of MODIS, uh, and again, uh, we are going to actually try to talk about the, like I said, the Na the VIRS is a uh, mission, uh, joint mission between NASA and NOAA. So, in therefore, there's some, uh, there's, uh, there are products which are actually developed by the NASA team, and there are products which are developed by the NOAA team. So, we'll go over some of those. Uh, both products. So this specific table actually describe the NASA product. Uh, all of the MODIS data is from the Na NASA. There are three different algorithms which works on them. Deep blue, dark target, Maya. And very, very important point to note that the MODIS data are available for past 20 years from 2000 to current time from two different sensors. Data are provided in HDF format. Now, when we talk about the VIRS, the VIRS data from SUMI NPP, again, aerosol optical depth, same product at the similar wavelength, but the spatial resolution is six kilometer. Uh, so instead of 10 kilometer or one kilometer, three kilometer, we have a six kilometer product. Again, daily, um, the two algorithm which right now provide from NASA, Deep Blue and DT. So in a sense that uh, one good thing is that the same algorithm, the dark target and deep blue have been applied on the viewers. So you will see a lot of continuity in terms of the data and the accuracies. Uh, the data availability is only from 2012 to current because viewers was launched in late 2011. And the data format is a little bit different. Now we have a net CDF format because this is much more common and most uh, more popular data format which has been used. Uh, NASA does not have currently any data product uh, on uh, NOAA 20. It only has uh, RGBs, but uh, in future that may change. 
here is an example of NASA product. Uh, uh, this is uh, a little bit more details on the deep blue algorithm. Like I said, it's a six kilometer product. It's called level two. The level three product is in the same resolution as MODIS, one degree resolution. Uh, other components along with the aerosol optical depth is angstrom exponent and aerosol type, which are also available from the uh, deep blue algorithm from the NASA product. The product name is AERDB. AER stands for aerosols and DB stands for uh, deep blue and level two means level two. Similarly, Dark Target has exactly the same uh, naming conventions, same products. Um, it's instead of AER deep blue, now it is called AER DT. And this image is just shown from the world view, an example of the fires in California. If we look into the uh, file name, uh, it is very, very similar to what we have been used from the MODIS. Uh, the file name consists of different information. Uh, the first ones are product name, ARDB. Again, in case of DT, it will change to DT. And then this is level two. This is sensor name, years. This is satellite name, SUMI NPP. This is the date in format of four digits years and then three digits day number so day number means january 1 will be 001 january 31st will be 031 and february 1st will be 032 and so on the time is in utc all of the satellite data are provided in utc time hours and may two digit hour two digit minutes and this is version one uh, only first version have been released so far from in terms of the Years and this last piece of information is a processing date, which may not be uh, too much um, of use for end users. These are the file names for the level three data uh, D3 is daily, M3 is the monthly, everything else uh, remains same as level two. And this is an example of file name for dark target retrieval algorithm. Again, some more details here already, I think we talked about, but I want to show here is when you open a uh, VS deep blue aerosol file, which I just described earlier, you will see there are several scientific data sets. SGS means there are scientific data sets inside. And this specific table provides some details. If you go on this link, you will find more details. I just want to point out a few of the parameters which are useful and which we will actually get into details. Uh, when Melanie shows uh, how to use the Python script on these data sets. So uh, there is a latitude and longitude for every pixels. And there is a parameter called aerosol optical thickness, 550 means 550 nanometer wavelength and land ocean bass estimate. So often um, in a file, we provide many different parameters. Some of them are uh, for research purpose. Some of them are uh, considered with different quality flakes depending on how the retrieval algorithm has retrieved that specific pixel. So this one is considered the best estimate. So if you are users and you don't want to worry about the quality flag and want to use the best data, this is the parameter you should be using. So just note that. Okay, now often we ask that question that, okay, how good are these data sets? So, to do that, uh, we do a validation, and validation is often performed using comparing the satellite data with the ground-based measurement. In this case, uh, the ground-based measurement is called Sun Photometer, uh, and the network is called Aeronet. And NASA has a network of Sun Photometer all around the world. There are almost 400 plus continuous uh, Measurement sites which are making measurements every five, 10 minutes uh, from all around the world. And this data sets is, uh, has long records. And you can get more details in this paper uh, by Christina in 2019. The important thing I want to point out here is that uh, here is the comparison between Modis Aqua, Modis Terra, Deep Blue Aerosol Optical Depth on the right and the VS on the left and you can see if the you see the statistics correlation coefficient bias they are very very comparable to each other so again the point is that even if you are started using vs data you are getting this almost same quality of the data as you have been getting from the modis in terms of their accuracy so this is a really good news 
uh, for continuity of the data sets. Here is another example. Some people often have a concern uh, how the temporal consistency exists between these sensors. So here is an example. Uh, two different sites. Uh, on the top, you have a Beijing in China. And on the bottom, you have a Goddard Research Flight Center in Eastern USA. Uh, it's more of suburban site. And then the Beijing is more industrial and urban uh, site. And what you see is the different colors time series starting 2000 to 2018 are different products. So Aeronaut is the ground truth in the black. And then these are monthly mean data actually. And then the Veers started in 2012 in the green. And then the Modis Aqua in 2003 in blue and Modis Terra in 2000. And you can see on a monthly mean scale, they are very consistent. They are following the seasonal cycle. They are showing the same long-term trend. So they, the data sets from these three sensors are very consistent. On the bottom is GSFC. You can see uh, even better agreement between the different sensors here. And I think this provide a lot of confidence in using the VS data for different applications. OK, uh, just want to give briefly, uh, there are uh, multiple uh, research papers published uh, over the years, uh, which described uh, a lot of details on these data sets from the VS, including algorithm validations, uh, so the top two papers are for VS deep blue algorithms, bottom paper by Virginia Sayre. Uh, she works in our team. She has just published a paper in remote sensing uh, discussing uh, some of the VS uh, dark target product. So if you want to get into details of algorithm validation, quality control and everything, uh, I would strongly recommend to refer these papers. Uh, they are very recent studies and provide great details about the data sets. Okay, so now let's spend five minutes to get how we get this data from NASA site. Okay, so people who have been using the uh, MODIS data, they already know this. Uh, this required a Earth data login as we instructed. So if you are on internet, uh, if you're already on internet, actually, if you're listening, so if you want to follow along with me, you know, I'm going to browse this data very quickly and show you how to get the data. So let's see if you can see my screen. I believe you can still see my screen. I hope so. OK, so just so that we don't have to remember where which website we have to go, I always use Google to search. It's called LADS, L-A-D-S, LADS web, and then NASA. If you type that, uh, the first link will comes the LADS DAC. This is the website which we will visit to get the data. Now, once you are on the website, uh, if you have not created your Earth data login, you will need that uh, to actually get the data. It's free. You just have to register yourself so that you can download the data. So just to check, you can click on the profile and then it will say Earth data login. It will take you to the login page. If you are already saved your username password, it will automatically log in and then we'll get back to. So I'm already logged in now. Okay. If you first time it will ask username password, you can save it if you want to keep it um, in use for features. But this is the website where you will download the data. There's a lot of information on this website about the data product, but I will go straight to the data sets where to find them. So there's a button called find data. I'll click on that. And this page will appear. So now you can actually select using the sensors and the available collection. But just to let you know that some of the most popular data sets are already listed here on the right. So like I said, AERDB L2 is the VS level 2, deep blue aerosol optical depth. So I'm going to select that. And then ARDT level 2 VS NPP is the next product which I'm going to select. If you cannot find them, you can also use the keyword to search here. And then you will be able to search those data. 
once I select the product, I will select for which date we want the data. So you can either select the date range if you're looking for long-term data for one month, one week, one year, or you can select the single date. So I'm going to just for example here, I'm going to select the data from three days ago from Monday, October 5th, and then add date. Now you can also add multiple dates here. So let's say you are trying to download the data for five different days, spread it throughout the years. You can select those individual date and it will save the search the data for you. Once you selected the date, now you need to tell the system which part of the world you want to get the data. So the location is important and there are many different ways in order you can actually define the location. You can search by countries, you can search by tile. This is more relevant for other data sets. You can also search by validation sites. So if you click on that, the validation site, the same Aeronet network I was talking about will display here and you can select any of those sites and it will download the data for that. But let's uh, get back to the more popular one is draw custom box. So you can draw a box around any region, right? And let me draw actually box to here in the Eastern US. Once I draw the box, the latitude, longitude will appear here. The range you can see below the location. It will also show as the current locations here. And then I can go to the next. Once I go to the next, all the files which falls within that region are going to come up here. I can download file by just clicking download and it will actually download on my local computer. I can also select all the files and then go to the next, click on the arrow on the top and all the files are here from the two different algorithms and then just submit order. Once I submit, you will receive an email with details, instruction on how to download all the files in one time. So this is a very simple process. Uh, just remember, um, it's very, very uh, similar to what we did for Modis. Again, uh, if you have doubts, uh, we have a tutorial on our set website. Uh, uh, we can point to that uh, on each of these steps which we just followed along here. Okay, I think uh, let's move on. Uh, we have about 20 more minutes to cover the, some more slides. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the presentation again. And then we will actually open these files in the, Melanie will show us actually how to open these files and do. So here is an example. I'm going to just provide very quick example of the data which we just downloaded. Uh, this is uh, different uh, similarities and difference between Modis and Veers for September 27, 2020, with very recent. On the left, you have a Modis Aqua aerosol optical depth derived from the deep blue algorithm. Again, you can see those black spots are the regions with the uh, orbital gaps. And there are also some regions uh, so again, if you don't know some glint, uh, refer to some of our old training and we have some description on those as well. If you look on the right is the veers. You don't see those orbital gaps in the data. The color actually here, I don't have a color scale, but the darker color shows high values and the lighter color shows the low value. If you look overall, both sensors provide similar spe uh, spatial distribution. You can see features like this uh, plume going over here, very similar. The values are very similar. Uh, there is a dust plume actually originating from the Saharan desert, which you can see actually better in Modis because in case of Vears, it actually fell in between the sun glint area and both sensors have similar problem when it comes to the sun glint. Uh, this is more zoomed in uh, case. Uh, again, mode is aqua for September 7 this year. Uh, as if you heard in the news, there were several fires in the United States, especially in California and some of the other states like Utah and Colorado, which actually created huge air pollution problem and other kind of uh, disaster problem 
uh, for almost more than a one month now, it's still going on some of these fires actually. And what you see is the smoke all over the US from this fire. And if you look the aerosol optical depth retrieved from the MODIS on the same day, you can see some of the high smoke plumes in high aerosol optical depth in case of MODIS retrieval. But also you will see there are areas where we are actually missing the retrieval of aerosols because of some of the algorithmic restrictions we have. If you look the same day uh, from the VIRS, uh, remember mode is aqua and VIRS makes measurement within 15 minutes of each other. So if you're not, if you need to compare the two, uh, it is better to compare with mode is aqua than Terra because mode is aqua and VIRS NPP makes measurement within 15 minutes of each other. So this is VIRS from the same day. You can see I'm going to go and back and forth. You can see very similar spatial pattern, but you will see a little bit better coverage of the smoke detection or the aerosol optical death retrieval in case of VIRS as compared to MODIS. So again, every reason for us to actually switch to VIRS, uh, it's uh, quality is same, um, the coverage is better, and it provides uh, longer continuity uh, in the future. Okay, now I'm going to switch into the NOAA aerosols data sets. Uh, this is very similar table. Uh, like I said, a VIRS is a NOAA missions, whereas the MODIS was a MODIS is a NASA mission. So NOAA does not produ produce any MODIS data sets in operational sense. They have some research algorithm, but for operational purpose, there is no MODIS product in terms of aerosols data. VIRS, on the other hand, they have they are retrieving VIRS from both satellite. Uh, although NASA is only retrieving from SUMI MPP, but NOAA is retrieving from both VIRS, NOAA SUMI MPP and NOAA 20. They have the data, uh, aerosol optical depth, and then smoke and dust mass, which you'll we'll see some example. The spatial resolution is 750 meter resolution, six kilometer. There are two aerosol product from NOAA. One is 750 meter resolution and one is six kilometer, which is very similar to what NASA provide. Daily global coverage, both are used the NOAA algorithm. Uh, the data availability from SUMI and PP is 2012 to current, and the VIRS on NOAA 20 is 2017 to current time. Uh, similar information on the file name, uh, the data sets from the NOAA comes into Six, uh, 86 second, one file contained the data for 87, 86 second actually. In case of uh, NASA data, one file contained the data for six minutes, uh, whereas the NOAA data comes in 86 seconds. So a uh, little bit different ways of organizing the data. A lot of this information is very similar to what we see uh, for the NASA product. A uh, couple of things I want to point out, the satellite name, J01 means this is JPSS or NOAA 20, NPP means SUMI NPP, so there are two VIRS. It says AOD and then S and E stand for starting date and time and ending date of time of that measurement. So you will see that only there's about 86 uh, second difference between the two. Some of the other product called, uh, this is where we get the smoke and dust masking. And in, in addition to smoke and dust, it also provides other flags like volcanic ash, um, unknowns like urban cloud flag, snow ice flags. And also it does give you a smoke and aerosol index. So when, when, wherever this pixel is detected as a smoke or dust, it will give you a value of dust or a smoke aerosol index. And the index will basically tell you whether it's a thick dust or thin dust layer or thick smoke layers or thin smoke layers. So higher the value, thicker the aerosol layers, either dust or smoke. And then also provide the quality flag, very similar to what NASA products provide. Here is an example showing the smoke mask uh, from NOAA. Uh, this is a little bit older example from 2015, but what you see this pink magenta color is the areas where the smoke has been detected using the VIRS uh, product. Again, these masks, smoke and dust are a qualitative indicator of where they have detected either smoke or dust. So, uh, they have a little bit less value in terms of the quantitative analysis, 
than aerosol optical depth. But they are very useful in identifying uh, transported dust or smoke and local sources. Okay, another example, um, again this summer, uh, many people might have heard that uh, there was a huge dust storm uh, originated in North of Africa and Saharan deserts, crossed Atlantic in several days and actually created air quality uh, problem in many areas, including uh, Caribbean islands, uh, east coast of US, Central America and uh, Southern America, parts of Southern America. And these dust um, actually carries not only PM 2.5, but PM 10 larger size particle, uh, which can be harmful for many different uh, uh, health impacts and they can also be, can impact the climate forcing. So the dust aerosol index is a great tool to actually track this down. Uh, NOAA has a very similar uh, tool called uh, J JSTAR mapper and that can be accessed from here. You can visualize uh, NOAA product on this specific tool. It's very similar to Worldview uh, with the NOAA product. Again, the smoke marks example from the fires in the US, uh, Western US. We had a lot of fires here in California during last few months. This is from September 14. You can see the smoke over ocean, over land. Actually, smoke is crossing Atlantic. We had seen cases where the fire, uh, smoke from the California fire actually crossed all the way to Atlantic and uh, affected air quality in some of the European country. At the same time, there was some dust detected in the north of Africa. And there was some biomass burning going on in Amazonia uh, in South America. So you, you can actually, this product gives a pretty good um, view of global uh, smoke and dust sources and where things are transporting. Similar uh, from the NOAA J uh, star mapper, you can also visualize aerosol optical depth, uh, again derived from the NOAA uh, products. Just want to give you an example here. Uh, I mentioned earlier NOAA has two data in two different spatial resolution. One is six kilometer, which is on the left, and one is on 750 meter resolution on the right. And this specific example is actually close to where I live in uh, Alabama. And what you see in the six kilometer, there are some uh, plume of high aerosol optical depth uh, in, uh, in Alabama. And when you see the same image, same place on the high resolution, then you can see those plumes more clearly. There are actually several fires which were burning. These are prescribed burning. And they were actually putting out the smoke plumes uh, in many different parts of Alabama and Mississippi and which are very, very easily visible in 750 meter resolution, uh, which is kind of uh, averaged out when you do the six kilometer resolution data. So again, uh, if you're looking for a small scale pollution event, uh, higher resolution can help you to identify those events. This is validation studies. This is just over India, but there are uh, other uh, studies which actually have done similar analysis globally, very similar in terms of the quantity quality as we saw for the NASA product. This is just an example of application. Uh, on the left, you have a NOAA 20 viewers also optical depth for October 7 this month earlier. And this, I just got it from the NOAA Tutor handle aerosol watch. And what you see this high aerosol optical depth are basically a smoke plume coming out from the Western fires. So we have fires in Washington, in California, there are some in the Midwest and all of them are putting out the thick smoke plume in the atmosphere. And that can be very, very visible in the Veers aerosol optical depth. Now Veers more recently have uh, launched a experimental PM 2.5 product uh, based on aerosol optical depth, which uh, they used to convert into 24 hour average daily particulate matter. And what you see on the right is the PM 2.5 air quality index derived using this AOD. So you can see high PM 2 concentration derived in regions where there were high aerosol optical depth were found. Now, there is there are a little bit difficult. It's not that easy to actually derive, go from AOD to PM2.5 because remember, AOD represent the columnar value for entire column of the atmosphere. So these aerosols can be anywhere 
in the atmosphere, two kilometer, three kilometer, whereas the PM 2.5 at the surface only. So there will be differences in terms of the, their spatial pattern. And when, when we go from one to another parameter, we have to take care of those differences. Uh, this is the tool which I was mentioning earlier. This is how it looks. It's very similar to World, NASA Worldview, uh, but with the NOAA products. If you need to get the NOAA aerosols data download, uh, you have to go to NOAA class. Uh, you can register here and then you can download the data. All the data are free from NOAA as well. And you can find more details if you click on this link, which will provide you step-by-step -step instruction on how to download the data. Hey everybody. Um, in this section of the webinar, I'm going to go over how to take a little bit of a deeper dive into the data files that Paulon was describing. So we have constructed several Python codes in the form of Jupyter notebooks to open, read, and map um, some of the VIRS data that Paulon was describing. And um, before I begin, I just want to emphasize that Every step um, I'm going to show you here is documented in the presentation materials. So actually, this is uh, from our website. This is the end of Pollen's presentation. And every step I'm going to go through is detailed here. So if you'd like to follow along, that's great. But if I'm going a little bit too fast, don't worry. Every step is here. So the first thing I'm going to show is our NASA RSET GitHub repositories. Here you can see that we have repositories for the NASA VIRS data files, as well as the NOAA VIRS data files. Today, I'm gonna to show you um, how to run the Jupyter Notebooks that we've created for the NASA VIRS, um, but the same procedure can be used to run the codes for the NOAA files. If we click on the NASA VIRS repository, you can see we have several files listed here. The first is an example VIRS data file. You can see, uh, as Pawan described, we can see that this is a deep blue level two VIRS SUMI MPP file. Um, here's the date, 2020, D number 56. We also have a README in each repository. And if we scroll down, we can see that the repository contains the samples VIRS data file, a README, and this file list text file and five scripts. And then each um, listed here is um, what each program does and kind of the steps it takes to do that. We have here file list.txt. If we click on this, we can see this file simply contains one text string stating the name of the file we're going to use. We also have five different Jupyter Notebooks here, read and map VIRS, read AOD and calculate PM 2.5, read VIRS and list the SDS. Those are the scientific data sets within each VIRS file. Read VIRS at a certain location and export uh, certain variables. So what I'm gonna demonstrate today is how to copy the code from these files upload them into a Google Drive, and run them using the Google Collaboratory application. So to start off, I'm just gonna show one file to demonstrate. If you click on the code for one of the Jupyter Notebooks, you can see, if we scroll down, you can see the sample code. If we scroll up to the top and we click on the raw to see the raw code, and if you just save this, we can just save this as a .ipynb file. So just save that somewhere on your computer. I've already done that. And you can do that for each of these Jupyter Notebooks. I'm just going to go back. So I'm just going to very quickly show that the VIRS NOAA repository contains the same, um, same file. So here we have two example data files. 
from the NOAA product. Similar, we have a README, a file list, and our five codes. Um, and here, when I'm going to click on the file list, you can see that instead of one, it just has two text strings of the file names. So if you want to adapt these codes to use them yourself, all you have to do is add um, different file names. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. So if we have our codes saved on our computer locally, you can go to your Google Drive. If you, hopefully, okay, I'm not sure why I'm getting that error. <laughs> Um, if you do not have Google Collaboratory added as an add-on, you can go here, search for apps, Collaboratory, and you can see I already have this installed, but you can just click this button to add it. Once you have Google Collaboratory installed on your Google Drive, you can open the Jupyter Notebooks in a, in a format that they can be run. I'm going to close this. To copy your, your, um, your codes into your drive, you can just choose to upload them, or you can just drag and drop them into, um, into your Google Drive. I recommend creating this, this folder. Colab Notebooks. To create a folder, you can right click and say create a folder, or you can use this method to upload files or upload an entire, entire folder. Um, in order for the codes to run properly, they need to be contained in a notebook, in a, sorry, in a notebook, in a folder called Colab Space Notebooks, exactly like this. I have already copied my codes in for this demonstration today. So the first code I'm going to start with is actually the list uh, scientific data sets code. And you can see we open with Google, Google Collaboratory. And here is our code. So the first thing I want to point out is in these two lines right here, what this is doing is this is accessing the NASA RSET VIRS NASA Git repository. And this line pulls all of the contents that I showed earlier. And I click back to be accessible by Google Collaboratory. If you want, you can change um, these lines to be accessing your own Google Drive. In the future, we'll put some commented lines in there to show um, users how to do that. For right now, if we click here to run this, these cells. Right now, it accesses Google File Stream in order to run. If we click on this link and click on the Gmail that you are accessing uh, for which your Google Drive is for, Click Allow. We copy this code. Go back to our go back to our Jupyter notebook and enter. And now it's cloning our GitHub repository. And when this stops, it is complete. The next set of cells installs the necessary libraries we need. And that usually just takes a second, and that is complete. This next set is the bulk of the code. And I'm going to scroll down a little bit to here. This is where this is accessing the VIRS NASA file list.txt file in order to read the text string that contains the file name. Down here, it's saying read that file from the VIRS NASA repository. So these are the lines that you would have to change in order to adapt the code to read your own files that you have potentially downloaded. So if we run this block of cells, 
we go down, it says, would you like to process this, the first file in the file list for Veers now? So we only have one. I hit enter, I hit Y and then enter. And here it lists all of the variables contained within these files. So pointing out um, the some of the SDS that um, Paul Wan specifically highlighted, highlighted. Here we have aerosol optical thickness at 550 nanometers land ocean best estimates. We have latitude, we have longitude, and various other um, variables. So going back to our notebooks, another code we have is to read and map a VIRS data file. We open with Google Call Laboratory. And the same procedure, we access Google File Stream. Copy the code. And we must wait for each step to complete before running the next step. We install our libraries. And while this is installing, I'm going to go over. This again is where we open the file list. Here is where we're accessing that particular file. Here is where we are listing each of the scientific data sets that we are uh, giving the user the option to plot. So these, if you wanted, these could be also changed. Here, we're calculating some statistics about the data. And here, we're specifying the particular color map that we're using to plot the data. Going up, we see that all the libraries have been installed successfully. We run our next cell. Oh, and the last thing I want to point out is down here, this is where we are saving um, our file that we're going to create, our map. So that is something that you might want to change as well. Here, we're saving right to the Colab Notebooks folder. So yes, we would like to process this file. I would like to plot number two, aerosol optical thickness 550 land ocean best estimate. Here are some statistics about the data, the average, standard deviation, median, and latitude and longitude range. I'd like to create a map, so I enter Y. And here it shows a map of this data. The colors show aerosol optical thickness. And I would like to save a copy of this map. And our code has run successfully. When we go back, let me just close these. When we go back to our Colab Notebooks folder, it usually just takes a second. But here is um, our file that we can just open. The next code I'd like to show is another one that will generate a map. So this code reads aerosol optical depth and calculates PM 2.5. And I want to emphasize that something that's highlighted here. This code uses a slope that's just meant for demonstrative purposes only. It's not meant to be used in any kind of quantitative analysis to generate your own slope, um, you would require, each slope is probably going to be specific to a given region and potentially even uh, time. So we begin again. Accessing Google File Stream. This is a little bit of a tedious step, but. We only have to do it once. If we were going to rerun the code, um, we would not have to do this again. So you can think uh, for each code, you have to do it once a session that you're using the code. And we're going to install our libraries. And again, while that's happening, I'm just going to scroll down here. This is, again, where we read that file list. This is where we read the actual file. These are the choices of SDS that we give the user. 
to use to convert to PM 2.5. These are just duplicates, but obviously I don't think that you'd use a quality flag to calculate PM 2.5. Down here, is where we ask the user, would you like to enter a slope? We're going to enter, no, we would not like to enter a slope because we're just going to use the default slope and intercept here. But again, that's just for demonstration for today. And then again, down here, we are going to save um, a map of that PM 2.5. So everything has run successfully here. We run. Yes, I would like to process this file. We again are going to pick number two, aerosol optical thickness, 550 land ocean best estimate. So we're going to enter two. And again, we have some statistics here. Um, would I like to enter a slope and intercept for the PM 2.5 calculation? No, because I'm going to use the default. Would I like to create a map? Yes. And we're getting some little messages there, but what this does is this uses the PM 2.5 and categorizes it into something called the air quality index, which is an indicator of how healthy or unhealthy the air is. And on this occasion, most of the air over land is qualified as good. So if we want to save this map, yes. And if we go back to our notebook, these take just a minute to appear. And here is our air quality index map. So the next code I'm going to demonstrate is reading a VIRS file at a given location. And this might be useful if you have a given station that you would like to compare to or an Aeronet station, potentially. We activate the Google file stream. And get our code. Copy our code. and install our libraries. Again, here's where we're opening that file list. Here's where we're opening the data file. Here, we are specifically saying that we would like to, to, to know the value of this variable, SDS name, at a given latitude and longitude that we will enter. That's, yes, so this has, the libraries have installed successfully. So we run the rest of our cells and yes, we would like to process this. So enter the latitude that you would like to analyze. And here we've stated the range of latitudes and longitudes, but not, ever, not every point will have valid data because of clouds or because of poor quality. So I'll just demonstrate that. So we're going to choose 20 degrees, which is within our range, and negative 100. And at this location, this is showing the actual latitude and longitude of the nearest pixel, the value of AOD at that pixel, but also uh, the values in a 3 by 3 and a 5 by 5 grid centered around that pixel average, median, and standard deviation in a five by five, and average, median, and standard deviation in a three by three. If you enter, if we just rerun this cell, yes. Okay, so now let's enter, say 12, and a different latitude and longitude, we see there is no valid data at this, uh, at this location. So this is the kind of result uh, that will be returned if you choose a latitude and longitude that does not have valid data. Our last code is export CSV. 
And what this will do is it will export um, values within a VRS data file to a text CSV file if you want to use it in something like Excel. So again, we're going to mount our GitHub repository and access Google File Stream. Okay, and then we wait for that to complete and we install our libraries. Again, in each file, here's where it is accessing the file list and here's where it is actually reading the VIRS data file. For this, we have chosen this SDS list to export. So into the CSV, we are exporting the aerosol optical thickness at 550 over land, land ocean best estimate, the quality assurance flag over land, the aerosol type over land and ocean, and the angstrom exponent, land ocean best estimate. Scrolling down, it is going to save that CSV file to the Colab Notebooks location. If we scroll back up. Yes, we would like to process this file. And it is listing out all of the variables that have been saved. So if we go back to the Colab notebooks, again, it'll take just a second to show up. And here is our CSV file. If we double click on this, we can open it with Google Sheets. It just takes a second, and we can see we have an Excel-ready file here where it's the year, month, day, hour, minute, and the, um, and the fields that we've specified, aerosol optical thickness. And going back to our, so going back to our Google Drive, we can see that all the files have been stored here. And again, I'm just going to emphasize one more time that if you want to run these with your own files that you've downloaded, you will have to change this. This is where we're accessing that file list and the files, just so it reads your own Google Drive. And then change where the program, where the code is looking for that file list and where it's looking for the data file and where it's going to save that file out. Um, by changing just these places in each of these codes, you can adapt them to read your own data files um, and save to your uh, specified location on your Google Drive. Um, again, all of this information is detailed in a step-by-step -step, um, within the presentation materials. I am not a Python expert, <laughs> but if you have questions, um, you can email either me or Pawan. Um, we've included uh, our emails in the presentation materials. And I think our next step is to go into the Q&A. Thank you. Great, thank you, Melanie. I think that was excellent. Um overview of some of the codes, uh, Python tools, which we have developed. I just want to re-emphasize that these uh, codes are provided as a sample code, which kind of provide basic building blocks like reading, mapping, extracting data uh, over certain location or converting data from NAT CDF to CSV uh, for people who don't have a lot of expertise in coding. But please, please make sure uh, uh, double check everything which is there in the code. Uh, when you start this codes for uh, your research, uh, you may often have to modify them to serve the specific purpose you want to do. Uh, but we are hopeful that these will provide you a basic building blocks 
uh, for further developments. And if you come up with some uh, other ways to do this, or if you have developed some other codes to uh, perform some other functionality, for example, plotting time series or grading data, um, we will be happy to hear and maybe uh, if there's something maybe we can adopt in our tra future training. So feel free to reach out to us and uh, use whatever is required. And uh, but again, be very careful uh, of uh, the codes and always double check. I think uh, so. Uh, a lot of people have questions. Uh, they have already entered in the question sections. And uh, if you have a still question, try to put it there. Uh, we are going to actually take question one by one. Um, Selvin is trying to put all the questions here in a Google Doc, which you should be seeing on your screen right now. And what we will do is we will take one question at a time and then we'll also try to type in the response so that actually we can provide that as a transcript on our website for you to later use it. So let's take the first one. Uh, the question one is I'm going to read and some of the question I will respond and some of them I will let Melanie uh, respond depending on what they are. Mm, so the first question is. Uh, at what time does GPSS overpass the equator? So right now we are only talking about the GPSS one. Um, it's also called NOAA 20. Cross equator crossing time is actually 12:40 p.m. Uh, during the daytime and then 12:40 a.m. during the night time. So it's remember 50 minute earlier than SUMI NPP, which is 1:30 p.m. Uh, equator time and then 1:30 a.m. Uh, night time. Okay. Uh, the second question, when both have the same specification, I believe this is referred to VRs, then why we have, why we need two VRs? Okay. Uh, so this is a really good question. I mean, why we do need more than VR, one VRs? We actually planning four of them. So one thing remember when satellite is uh, designed and launched, there is expected lifetime. And it typically varies from uh, five years to seven years. In case of MODIS, they were actually only designed for to last for three to five years. But now, uh, because of the advancement in technology or more confidence uh, in space technology, they are now designed, uh, the VS is designed to last up to seven years. So in order to have a continuous data records, uh, every few years, four or five years, uh, you want to uh, launch a new identical sensor so that we can get the continuity of the data and that is why we have this uh, SUMI NPP JPSS 1 to 4 to ensure continuity of the data from these sensors. Great. Uh, the third question, are VS data available on GEE which is Google Earth Engine? So some of the data are available. Um, uh, in the Google Earth Engine, uh, not all of them. Typically, Google Earth Engine only keep the data which are gridded. So even if there are some VS data, uh, you might find that some uh, land products might be there because they are usually gridded. And some of the level three data sets might also be there because they are also in grid format. Okay, uh, question four, on slide 17, the difference in band was specified. They are very similar, but in difference, is this the difference significant or the third decimal difference not significant and makes the product almost comparable? And how would you make a continuous time series when combining the two sources? So this is about the uh, uh, difference in MODIS and VIRS channels. So, when we are creating RGBs, uh, MODIS has uh, three bands which uh, centered around red, green, and blue. And then the VIRS also have a similar. But as mentioned here in the question, there are minor difference in the central wavelength. So for RGB application, those difference are okay. These, those are not significant because we are trying to make an image for the visual. 
when we do go to level two data sets, um, usually we considered exact uh, bandwidth of each uh, sensor and there is something called a spectral response function. So each, uh, each band has a spectral response function and we consider that while making theoretical calculations and making retrievals. So when the final products comes out, like for aerosol optical depth, it will always be reported at 550 nanometer uh, or other wavelength. And those are more or less identical between the sensors. So if you are comparing between MODIS and Aeronet or MODIS and VIRS, as long as you are using the same wavelength, uh, they are comparable and there should not be any problem in combining the data. You will still have to uh, consider other aspects uh, which are more related to the calibration accuracies or um, accuracies in the data product itself, but the wavelength factor should not uh, provide any obstacle in combining the data. Okay, uh, question number five. Is there a way to query the LAT stack data through code API? So I think API means application parameter in application programmatic interface, I believe for those who don't know. And it is often used to do download the data in automatic sense through um, cron job or other kind of application. I think uh, what we have is called OpenDAP and OpenDAP allow uh, API access. Um, so all the data uh, from MODIS and VIRS are available through the OpenDAP server. The link is provided in the uh, answer sheet uh, and it's from the same LATS website, uh, which allow you to access the online data through the OpenDAP server. I think the question number six is the same uh, question uh, and we have provided the uh, OpenDAP uh, link there as well. Question number seven, does this portal allow near real-time data download? For example, for continue monitoring or forecasting purpose. So there are two data stream often one is called operational uh, data stream which is uh, we get from the lats and the operational data streams are depending on the data product it can be behind uh, in data processing by at least two to three days so if you're looking for the data in real time there is another stream called near real time data stream and usually those data are a little bit different they use the same algorithm but remember, uh, there are several ancillary data set which we have to use to simulate atmospheric conditions. And uh, those data may not be available in near real time. Uh, so the near real time application often use either climatological values or forecasting from the model. So they become a little bit different in terms of the ancillary data sets, but the algorithm remains same. And often we keep those data separate. Uh, they are available through website uh, from the Earth Data Login. Uh, let me, the link is provided in the uh, answer sheet, so you should be able to have that. Uh, but, uh, and they are available within few hours of the satellite overpass, typically one to three hours. Also, uh, if you are only interested in visualizing near real time data, uh, they are available through Worldview uh, to actually display aerosol optical depth, fires, RGB, from VRs, all of them available in Worldview to display within a couple of hours of satellite overpass. Okay, question eight, are the NOAA ADP AOD products on a fixed grid? Uh, same cell size everywhere and same centroid for every overpass. Uh, no, they are pixel based data. Uh, so the locations of those pixels will change from one day to the next day to the next day. Uh, and they are in the same way as NASA product, um, like aerosol optical lab, they are not gridded. Um, the pixel resolution um, in case of VIRS changes uh, as you go from nadir position to the edge of the uh, swath, but there are additional corrections uh, VIRS uh, 
team applies to actually minimize that uh, change in size. In case of Modis, the pixel size changes uh, by a factor of four going from Nadi to the edge of the swath. Whereas in case of Veers, because of additional processing applied, it only changes by a factor of two. So um, the pixel size changed by a factor of two in case of Veers. Okay, uh, question number nine. Uh, for five years temporal change, which month data is to be taken so that the five year of Terra are combined? Uh, I am not sure if I understand that question properly. For five years temporal change, which month data is to be taken so that five year analysis can be done? So if you're doing five year analysis, I would recommend to use all of the month. 12 month from January to December, uh, if I understand your question correctly, uh, but I don't know if that is something else you want to ask. Okay, question number 10. So for a daily average data, which of the data should be, should one use? What is Aqua, Terra or combined? So unfortunately we do not have a Modis, uh, Terra and Aqua combined data. Uh, uh, you will have to use individual data. Uh, if you are trying to get a daily average, it is, uh, of course, will provide, if you average both Terra and Aqua, that will provide you a better uh, estimate of daily mean than just one measurement. Uh, but still remember, those are two measurements only. It's not, it cannot be considered as daily mean, but it's better than one measurement. Question number 11, uh, with the NASA level two AOD data, there is an aerosol type flag that has dust and also smoke flags. Are the same as the NOAA dust and smoke flag that is calculated in the same way? No. So yes, that is correct that NASA level two data has uh, aerosol type flag and they are usually the different they are basically saying that what aerosol model they have used to retrieve aerosol optical depth. So they are not done separately. They have not detected aerosols uh, in case of MODIS uh, uh, VS product, uh, sorry, in case of NASA VS product. Uh, they are very different than what NOAA does. NOAA separate, there is a separate algorithm in NOAA which actually do the aerosol detection product uh, and which are based on the spectral characteristics. Here in NASA, uh, it's only identifying the aerosols model which goes into aerosol retrieval uh, and just saying that this is the model which we use to retrieve this particular AOD pixel. So they are very, very different. Okay, uh, let's see. Question number 12, the NASA level two has a, I think, sorry, the, the Veers deep blue aerosol product seems to retrieve AOD over both land and ocean, but I believe the Modis deep blue product retrieve AOD over land only. Could you provide some insight on this? Yes. Yes, that is true. Uh, so Modis uh, deep blue algorithm came along uh, very late in the mission's life. Uh, uh, they started retrieving aerosol optical depth around 2008, 9 or 10, uh, almost 10 years after the launch. And the operational algorithm before that was MODIS dark target, which has been retrieving aerosol optical depth both over land and ocean. Um, and the ocean product from the dark target are very good in terms of accuracy. So the MODIS operational products are still uh, over ocean comes from the dark target algorithm. Now, when it gets to the MODIS uh, VIRS aerosol data, uh, initially actually MODIS uh, deep blue algorithm was selected to be an operational, uh, to provide an operational data sets uh, uh, for better accuracies over land. So VIRS team actually came, uh, the deep blue team came along and derived a new algorithm to retrieve uh, aerosols over ocean as well. So now uh, starting VIRS uh, on SUMI MPP, uh, deep blue algorithm 
provides aerosol optical death retrieval both over land and ocean um, and the dark target does the same way but uh, uh, the coverage in deep blue is uh, better because of the, some of the restriction it doesn't have as dark target algorithm has uh, but those two algorithms are completely different uh, if you are doing uh, that kind of research uh, just pay attention to the specific algorithm Question number 13. Uh, in the second algorithm, calculation of PM 2.5, where do we define the area that we want to run the analysis? I believe this is referred to the Python script, uh, which we ran to calculate the PM 2.5 map. So the, the way the script work is it takes input of uh, aerosol optical depth, and that comes from the file which you are providing. So you can run that anywhere in the world as long as the data file of aerosol optical depth you are providing as input is from that region so whichever region the data file represent it will calculate the pm 2.5 for that region again though that is just for an example and the slope and intercept are just to give you a sense of uh, how it looks uh, but for different parts of the world you will probably have to provide your own slope and intercept to get better accuracy of the estimated PM 2.5 and it's only for qualitative purpose uh, it's not meant to be used for quantitative purpose question number 14 is there an advantage to running the IPY NV files in Google Colab instead of Jupyter uh, I think there's no advantage they should run using the Jupyter um, um, you can access from the NASA's RSET GitHub repository and they should run uh, without any problem. You might have to make some changes in terms of the path because the way right now uh, we have set up the code, we use the path uh, as Google Drive or Google Colab. So if you are running on either on your local computer or uh, some other uh, online platform, then uh, you will have to take care of the path uh, where the data are, are read from and where you are saving the output from those codes. Other than that, I think they should run smoothly on any platform. Okay, question number five, uh, mapping, export, this kind of activity can we do in Panoply? Yes, Panoply allows uh, up to certain, uh, you can do the map. Uh, definitely you can export the CSV also uh, but the panoply export of CSV it's a little bit different formatting uh, in this Python code you actually get a little bit more organized uh, formatting of the CSV file but definitely you can use panoply as well if you are more comfortable with that question number 16 how is the level 3 data produced and how is it decided which algorithm will be used so level 3 data are actually uh, produced uh, from both algorithms so right now on VRS, nasa is running two algorithm dark target and deep blue and both algorithm produce level 3 data also so the level 3 data are nothing but uh, taking level 2 data retrieved from individual algorithm and averaging over either different time scale like day week or month or year or averaging over larger spatial areas so for example the level 2 data are retrieved at 6 kilometer but whereas the level 3 data are reported at 1 degree spatial resolution which is about 110 kilometer by 110 kilometer in spatial resolution so you take all the six kilometer pixels which falls within that 110 kilometer by 110 kilometer area and average them for a given day that will become daily mean uh, aerosol optical depth for that day and that we will call it level three data similarly we do the same thing for a month so you first calculate the daily and then from daily you can calculate the monthly averaging all the days within that month 
that is how the level three and there are some more uh, details uh, which you can find in ATVT and some of the reference which I have given in the UPT. Okay. Question 17. Instead of index, can we have the actual values? What would be the unit of measurement? Okay. I am not sure if I understand that question. Um, aerosol optical depth uh, is unitless quantity. Um, uh, also aerosol index, if you're referring, that is also a unitless quantity. Um, I, I think that's all I can say about that question unless you want to revise it in another question later on. Question 18, uh, do we have to install necessary libraries each time we run the code in Google Colab? Uh, I think I'm not 100% sure about that, but if you're running uh, the code, uh, you only have to do once. Uh, as long as all the codes are in the same directory. Um, and uh, let's see, Melanie, do you have some more insight on that? I believe the first two cells are the ones that just need to be run once. So the one that's accessing and cloning the NASA R set Git repository, that's the first set. And then the second set is where we load the libraries. If when you're starting to work on a particular notebook, you run that first cell, you run the second cell, and then if you want to be changing things within the bulk of the code, don't believe you have to run those first two cells again. It saves that information. Thanks, Melanie. Okay, question number 19. Uh, where can we find the methodology on calculating area specific slope to convert your DPM to 0.5? Uh, so, unfortunately, there is no textbook solution for any reason. Uh, you will have to do some research. Uh, we do have some training material uh, uh, in our past uh, trainings where we have actually gone into a uh, lot of details about aerosol optical depth and how to convert that into PM 2.5. We discuss uh, different ways in which uh, research communities have been uh, converting that. There are regression methods, there are machine learning methods, uh, there are model uh, scaling approaches. Uh, so I think there are uh, different ways in which you can do that and uh, we will try to provide that link here uh, where we have done an advanced training on those methods. Question number 20, in order to stabilize, uh, stabilize uh, PM2.5 data by utilizing AOD data, should I need ground measurement uh, for regression model? What if the ground measurement does not exist in that area? Okay, so the question is, do I need PM2.5 data to calculate to develop some regression? So it also depends um, if you are trying to build a study, whether it's a regression or a machine learning model where you're training, uh, then you, yes, you need some ground measurement. But there are other approaches where actually you can use uh, global or regional uh, models uh, and use that to scale your aerosol optical depth into PM2.5. And in the, those cases, you really don't need uh, ground measurement. But the problem with those things are that um, the research shows they works very well when you are averaging over longer time period, like a year. Um, and they have often more uncertainties when you do those kind of analysis on a daily scale. Uh, also, I think uh, uh, if you don't have a ground measurement, then it will be very hard to tell uh, uncertainties in those uh, retrieved PM 2.5 using that method. Okay, let's see, uh, next question. Does the AOD demonstrated include the column integrated value? Yes, the AOD values are column integrated values uh, always. 
if so do we get the aod value corresponding to the height we need no uh, the passive sensors like modis and veers provide aerosol optical depth for the entire column of the atmosphere from the surface to the top of the atmospheres we do not get aod for different layers of the atmosphere or different height uh, to do that, uh, we need uh, something uh, more sophisticated sensors uh, uh, called active sensors or LIDAR. And there are uh, a couple of LIDARs in this space. One is called Calypso, which provides uh, vertical profiles of AOD or extinction or aerosol. Uh, that data can be obtained. The only uh, problem with that, the Calypso has a very limited ground zone because it's an active sensor, so it has to send the laser pulse down to the uh, surface to make those measurement and those laser pulse are only can cover 100 meter area in a given time so its coverage is very limited but that is one of the option there are ground based lidar also which can provide some information on vertical aerosols uh, those are located uh, in many places around the world okay uh, Question 22, how do you compare VS data with Sentinel-5P data? Okay, um, so one good thing about Sentinel-5P, uh, the sensor uh, on board Sentinel-5P is uh, TROPOMI, uh, which kind of provide, uh, uh, it's a little bit different sensors than VS. VS is a, we call it multi-spectral sensors, whereas the TROPOMI is hyperspectral sensor it ranges from the uv to visible to ir channel uh, in theory you can get uh, uh, similar information from tropomi as well uh, the good and you can compare the, the the data from the two in terms of radiance or level two data uh, depending on the product and the, another good thing about that comparison is that these two satellites actually make measurement within 5-10 minutes of each other. So SUMI and PP, VIRS and TROPOMI uh, on Sentinel-5P actually flies within 5 minutes of each other. So they are very temporarily co-located and there are uh, attempt to combine the data from the two sensors to actually uh, retrieve more piece of information. For example, VIRS has such a high spatial resolution of 375 meter resolution, whereas the TROPOMI resolution varies in three to five kilometer range. So VIRS can do better job in detecting clouds. So you can actually detect the clouds from VIRS and then apply that cloud mask on TROPOMI data to actually get more accurate aerosols and trace gas observation from TROPOMI. So there are different ways in which you can use the two data sets uh, jointly and there are uh, research attempts uh, going on uh, in different uh, uh, in different uh, research centers to actually make that happen. Okay, uh, let's see. Is it possible to run the Jupyter from my computer as against the Google Drive? And what is the disadvantage of doing this? So I think I'm going to just read what Melanie wrote there. The code should run using Jupyter. If NASA R said git repository can be accessed, you might need to change the file path uh, where the file list or text and the data files are located and where you are saving the maps and files. So, the short answer is yes. Uh, I think there is no advantage or disadvantage. Only thing is you will have to change the path, uh, either the file names or the output where you are saving. Um, if you make those changes, you should be able to run it locally. Question 24, can we detect the impact of tropical cyclone over Bay of Bengal on aerosol properties through VIRS? Uh, the philosophical answer is yes, but it will require um, research and develop methodologies how to do that. Um, I'm not expert of tropical cyclones, so I don't know what really goes into that, um, but uh, the data is there 
and if somebody wants to explore that uh, i'm sure there should be some ways to do that Um, I just want to add one more thing there that uh, to do such studies where you are trying to understand weathers and cloud and inter interaction with the aerosols, often models are preferred because there we can actually control uh, different things. So usually people use models to do such kind of studies. Question 25. Uh, in order to match with the ground measurement, should I convert the data time, which is originally in UTC, into regional time to follow ground measurement time? Yes. Always, uh, when you are comparing the two data sets, always ensure they are representing the same time. Uh, uh, and also, sometimes ground data are also repeated in UTC, so you will really have to make that choice based on how the ground data are reported. If ground data are already in UTC, don't, you don't have to convert anything. If you think the ground data are in local time, uh, then you will have to make that correction. How often a city is captured by either MODIS or VIRS in a given month? Okay. So typically, um, MODIS probably look at each city all around the world every one to two day. Uh, Veers looks every single day. Now, when we talk about the aerosol data, although Veers is uh, passing over each city every day, it doesn't mean it will have aerosol data each day uh, because aerosols data are only available under cloud-free conditions. And if we look the global statistics, on a given time, on a given place, there is always 50% chance of cloud cover. So if we go by that matrix, uh, I'm assuming uh, on a given month, uh, again, it really depends on many factors where that city is located, tropics versus mid latitude versus high latitude. Uh, you might get, if it is very high latitude, you may get almost daily measurement because there can be multiple years overpass in a given day. If you're on a tropic, uh, then you may get 10 to 15 days of data in a given month. Uh, typically, we have seen uh, around 8 to 10 days of the data uh, on a given, uh, uh, in a given month uh, from the viewers. Question 27, can you please mention the time of measurement in both Terra and Equa? So Terra is 10.30 local solar time, equatorial overpass time. Equa is 1.30 p.m. local solar time, uh, equatorial overpass time. So 10.30 and 1.30, three hours apart from each other. Question 28. How do we get the AOD value up to a particular height for estimating PM 2.5? Yeah, this is the same question as we discussed earlier. Uh, the AOD values are column integrated values. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot get AOD for different height from the VS or MODIS. Question number 29. Is there any algorithm that might be used to get PM2 point from AOD for quantity data? Yes, uh, there are uh, many research attempts uh, and there are some product also. Uh, available. Uh, there are some which are available globally. There are some which are available regionally. The one example I gave you in the uh, today's talk was from US. So NO has an algorithm uh, based on regression method, which can actually convert uh, AOD to PM 2.5, and they put out that data uh, through their tools. Uh, it's called Aerosol Watch, and you. Uh, you should be able to get that visualization from them. There are other attempts where people have used other methods uh, to convert that. Uh, NASA does not have any operational PM 2.5 product right now. Uh, so it's only available through other agencies for now. Uh, 
the question 30 is i think similar uh, again um, uh, later on i will provide some reference uh, papers which you can actually refer to get some of those uh, exact uh, slope intercept for different parts of the world okay question 31 what are the advantage disadvantage of using data that are in google earth engine instead of using what we did today okay so the google earth engine actually um, although we didn't cover that topic today but the google earth engine is uh, is a tool uh, developed by google and it used the power of their cloud services so they have a huge cloud which means there are so many supercomputers and what does what google earth engine does is is provide an interface between those clouds and their data center so you can develop some python script or javascript so you don't have to download any data their data is connected and then you can run on their computers they are much faster in that sense so i think that is the advantage of using and then also it provides a lot of gis type capabilities graphic data analysis capabilities uh, so those are some of the advantage of using google earth engine but unfortunately it does not have all the data uh, which uh, you might need i think there is also option in google earth engine where you can upload your own data but it has to be in certain format Question 32, can comparison of AOD between Calypso and VS possible? Yes, there have been attempt. There are say, many, I think, studies already out there with just that. And if yes, what parameter needs to consider? So uh, Calypso does provide actually column integrated AOD values. So you can actually compare that directly with the VS AOD. Question 33, is there some documentation on the NOAA aerosol detection product? Uh, explaining how it is calculated yes so in the presentation uh, i have a slide and a link uh, which will take you to the another presentation and that presentation actually contain uh, a lot of details on the uh, algorithm and then also it has a link to the their error uh, atbt which is called algorithm theoretical document which provides a very very detailed description of the algorithm and we can probably provide that link here uh, later on. Okay, question number 34, how can I get repository of fire hotspot and early warning system of fire by running a code like the sum of you demonstrated? So the fire uh, data are um, available uh, in near real time uh, using a website called firms uh, f i r m s uh, it's a nasa online tool to actually download or visualize uh, near real time fire data uh, and if you go on that website there's several different options uh, to get the data in kmz format in text uh, csv format text format or you can get the data through API, you can also get the data in shape files. Um, so I think that that website provide a lot of uh, uh, different ways to download data, either manually or automatically. Okay, I think that was the last question. Do we have more questions? Or uh, we're done? Um, Brock Selwyn, do we have more question or we are almost done? Yeah, you know, that, that seems to be it. There was just a question about homework and certificates. Um, I just want to mention that the homework is available on the training webpage right now, and it's due by the 31st. If you turn that in, it's a Google form. If you submit that by the 31st and your attendance here was already logged by the software, you will receive a certificate within two to three months. Great, thanks, Brock. Um, anything else, Melanie? You want to add anything? I missed. Nope, I think that just about covers everything. 
Great. Uh, Selwyn, do you have anything? No, I don't have anything, Pablo. Okay, great. So I think, uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining today. Uh, this was only one session. Um, and uh, Jonathan, I see you are also there. Do you have any instruction for participants or anything? Uh, no, uh, Brock covered it. Uh, homework is available on the web page. And uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. So I think that's all we have today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And thanks, the offset team, for pulling this together. Like I said, it required number of people to pull training like that. So I really uh, like to thank everyone uh, for helping in different parts of the, this training and all the participants for joining us please uh, feel free to send us your question um, in the email our email address is there the transcripts of this question answer will be we will review it in a couple of days and hopefully we'll provide with all the links which we promised uh, so it should be available from the website in few days uh, for everyone to go through the recordings will also be available and if you want to you, if you think that you didn't get enough, uh, tune in again at uh, in a few hours. So we'll have another session at uh, 3 p.m. EST time, uh, which will be basically the same session. Uh, we'll just we'll repeat the same information there. So with that, thank you, everyone. Have a good day wherever you are in the world, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.